Hello. Hello, good morning. Uh, this is Ashish. I'm representing EP South Asia. Um, I welcome you to the third webinar in the series of webinars that we are conducting. Um, day before yesterday, we had a webinar on parking management in city. Yesterday, there was a webinar that we conducted on electrification of IPT. And today's webinar focuses on non motorized transport in cities for all. Uh, streets for all focus. This presentation is based on actions that are initiated and supported on the road in partner cities uh, on the theme of non motorized transport and is going to be followed by comments and uh, responses from experts who are joining us today. We have Amit Bhatt, who uh, he represents WRI, and we have with us uh, Abni Mehta from uh, Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation. Post this, we'd be happy to receive questions from uh, representatives, participants who joined us in this presentation. Uh, there's an option in the webinar that allows you to post your question during the conduct of the webinar and we'd be happy to pick it up and uh, discuss it as part of the webinar discussion. I specifically want to mention that uh, this work has been uh, implemented as part of handholding technical support to smart cities of Gwalior, Ludhiana, Udaipur and Vishakhapatnam focused on mobility and built environment, and it has been possible through the support of Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation. And uh, the work is implemented through by ICLE South Asia in association with Sandeep Gandhi Architects. Yeah, um, so the background, uh, this is the background start slide. I, I wanted to just remind everybody that uh, the work that we've done in the, to the Smart City Mission, which uh, is a central concept of, uh, conducted by the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, um, focusing on inclusive and sustainable development in compact city and creating a comfortable model for other cities. Um, provision of efficient mobilities, affordable housing, and sustainable environment are part of the four infrastructure elements as part of this. Uh, what is noteworthy is that if you look at the projects that have been uh, suggested as part of uh, the various smart city proposals um, under the mission, we see that a majority of projects focus on mobility. Uh, whether it be area and economic development uh, focus, whether it be transport and mobility specifically for smart solutions, being mobility projects that, that are the major chunk of projects that are uh, identified under the various smart cities. And so it's, an, it's a very important uh, focus area, which through our support in the four cities, we've tried to influence to uh, that projects get implemented as envisaged on this slide tells you the current status of uh, the mission we are uh, till march um, at about um, half of the projects that were in charge starting on ground they may be uh, costing around 40 percent of total funds but they are more or less around 30, uh, 50 percent of the entire set of projects that were planned under the mission so we are at a fast track now. It seems like a lot of action on is already taking place. As part of the mission, like I mentioned earlier, um, ICLE South Asia, together with SGA, uh, has worked on four specific smart cities. These include Ljubljana, Gwalior, Udaipur, and Vishakhapatnam. Um, this has been consistent uh, support and holding inputs to a mobility and built environment projects in these uh, smart cities. 
Um, in the past, though, we have also been associated with Jaipur and Kakinara cities, and there has been some interest to their SCP uh, design and implementation during that engagement. So, in terms of the way that we've been working, it's, uh, is really four cities where uh, looking at the SCP, the Smart City proposal. Uh, the vision of it and the projects envisaged. We have, as a project team, providing technical inputs, worked with the municipal corporation, the ULB, Development Authority, uh, the SPV, the PMC, and all other line departments to conceptualize and implement a number of uh, projects that show the way to the city in terms of how they can go further in implementing these projects that have been thought of as part of the uh, smart city. I would invite uh, Sandeep now to share with you slides on uh, how and what we've done focused on the non-motorized transport aspects in the Sandeep. Thank you. Okay, sorry, some technical glitch. I'll start again. Thank you, Ashish. Um, so I will start uh, in the next in the next couple of slides. I will uh, explain uh, uh, the interventions that were uh, that we supported. Uh, as part of our support to all of these four smart cities. Uh, uh, our approach uh, to begin with, when we extended this support, uh, had, had to achieve three agendas. The first one of them was that we were looking at an image building uh, in terms of that we are not, uh, these projects should not be uh, looked at uh, standalone projects, but uh, part of a wider city improvement approach. So they should all be scalable. Uh, the activities should be, or uh, the processes should be such that these projects become uh, scalable at city level, and it uh, and the smart city agenda or the vision is achieved, which is which uh, all cities have included in their uh, smart city uh, documents, uh, smart city proposals. The second ag agenda was that uh, uh, the support should not be uh, an outsider's view; it should not be seen as an outsider's view. It should not be seen that. Uh, we as an experts are coming from Delhi and uh, talking to cities about uh, their problems and as if we know everything about all of these problems. It had to be uh, a consensus building exercise where everybody was on board and uh, the solutions were developed in the city and by the stakeholders and not by external experts. And the third agenda was that, uh, that it, through this, these processes, uh, sort of capacity building is achieved, uh, which allows, which really results into the scalability which is desired. The support for all to all of these four cities was provided in, um, uh, you can say, as in six uh, categories. Uh, to uh, problem assessment, solution development, uh, planning and advisory support and capacity building support was provided to all four cities. Uh, uh, 
uh, implementation support was also extended to uh, cities of Udaipur and Ludhiana. And by implementation, what I mean is that we worked with the PMC uh, to take some of the planning uh, and solutions that were uh, plans and solutions that were developed to uh, a tender stage. And also in Udaipur, we uh, did some pre feasibility work. Uh, these were projects which were already in the pipeline. Uh, and we basically looked at the pre feasibility of these projects. Am I audible? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, as a snapshot of what kind of interventions or support was provided to these four cities, uh, we basically uh, the support was to be for uh, non-motorized transport, and uh, so we. Uh, but the, the current pro projects which were already listed uh, in the smart city proposals there were limited projects related to non motorized transport specifically to non motorized transport but there were projects which were on junction development and which were on uh, street infrastructure development smart street development where you could integrate you could uh, intervene as uh, bring in non motorized transport specific infrastructure and plans uh, and so what we had done was that we worked in udaipur we looked at some 10 junctions uh, of which three were worked at in much more detail. We also looked at two streets in Udaipur. Uh, in Vishakhapatnam, we looked at two junctions. For some reason, the screens are not moving. Yeah. They're not moving. So uh, it seems we have an issue with the screen moving, and we'll just resume in a minute. Okay, I hope everybody can see the screen now. Uh, fine. So, uh, as I was mentioning, this the, we had looked at these four cities. Uh, the, the kind of intervention that was provided was at junction level and at street development level. And uh, uh, therefore, there were 10 junctions, three of which were done in detail. In Vishaka Patnam, we looked at. In Vishaka Patnam, we looked at. In Gwalior, we looked at. One in Jana, one in Jana, we looked at five. The first level of the first level of support when the cities was in in identifying the problem for which the solution is being sought. So. Uh, because there was an SCP in place in all of these cities, uh, there were projects already listed in these SCPs or there were solutions that were already listed in these SCPs. And so, uh, is the audio, hello, am I visible? Oh, I'm sorry. and I'm audible, sorry. Yeah, audible. I think I'm back. Okay, sorry for those issues. Uh, so, uh, as I said, that the solutions were already in. I mean, there was uh, perception of solutions was already there, and the perceived, and so there were already some perceived issues for which these solutions were sought to be thought to be appropriate. And what we, uh, what our first realization when we went to the, the cities was that there was a gap between these perceived and actual uh, perceived issues and actual findings from the ground. When we did our preliminary surveys and we did our preliminary findings, uh, we we, uh, we the first discussions we had with the cities was about these gaps. And typically, the gap was that the cities perceived the issues to be capacity constraint on their streets. And what we found from our numbers was that the problem was really to do with friction and not really so much uh, about the capacity. Uh, and so the solutions that would come out of uh, this new understanding of problems 
uh, would definitely be different. And so we went again through a discussion mode with all the stakeholders in the room. We went through a process uh, which took us from the mobility, uh, from the problem assessment to a solution identification uh, debate. Uh, and this is just a flow chart which shows you uh, how that uh, decision making went about. And uh, we, we, we started the discussion for the both motorized and non motorized modes. And uh, it came to a uh, common point where everybody said that provisions for non motorized traf traffic cannot be made or we have not been able to make it throughout the city because. Uh, there's not enough space, there's not enough width, carriageway width, and even and we are facing traffic congestion even with the available width uh, entirely being used by motor vehicles. Uh, this was then uh, verified. We took some data on the, on the from the streets and we analyzed the data, and then we could show that it was the capacity was not not really a problem. The demand was much lower than the capacity, and when we debate all of the solutions that are possible in this situation, it all comes down to geometric design improvements and probably signal designs that can be done uh, for junctions. Uh, so uh, for junctions, the two solutions were, that were identified, especially because most of the intersections in these cities were unsignalized. Um, so the so two solutions that could be one passive solution was to develop roundabouts and active solution is to develop signalized junctions. Uh, when you when you're looking at roundabouts, uh, of course, which solution gets applied it, at which intersection uh, had to go through a logical, rational process, and we basically used the standards that were available to debate it with, debate it out with the stakeholders, and it was decided that most of the cities uh, roundabout is the ideal uh, solution for the junction improvement. Uh, as long as they have enough right of way or enough space to provide the roundabout or the required diameter of the roundabout as per the standards. And uh, so, uh, to begin with, when we started with Udaipur, uh, providing advisory support to Udaipur, uh, we basically uh, went to these junctions on ground. Uh, we looked at the space that is available. We had discussions uh, at different time periods. We had discussions when there were during peak hours and when there were the streets were occupied with a lot of activities. And then we had discussions with different stakeholders in the middle of the night when there was no activity and you could see the whole expanse of the road that is there. And uh, using these uh, discussions as the starting point. We uh, started uh, this process uh, of developing solutions uh, uh, for these junctions. And uh, those solutions were developed initially by rasterizing Google Earth images. And this was this exercise, most of this exercise was done sitting in these, uh, by being present in the city and being present in the offices of the ULBs with all of these stakeholders around. So uh, we rasterized the Google Earth images. We uh, we overlaid all the activity mapping on it. So I mean, in the in this image, I don't know if you can see the cursor. Uh, the site activity was mapped. Or all the hawkers that were there, all the parking that was happening, all the goods auto rickshaws and other auto rickshaws that were parked at the junction. And this is Suraj Pole Junction. Uh, they were mapped and shown. Then we basically in the network we measured the traffic. We measured both pedestrian traffic and vehicular traffic, and. Uh, Using that, we came up to a solution, uh, a draft proposal, where uh, these inputs uh, led to a solution of a, let's say, a roundabout junction, some one-way streets or circulation plan. And using that, we had th this was debated uh, with all the stakeholders, uh, and, and uh, plans were first debated. Once the plans were approved and agreed upon. Uh, we converted these plans, uh, the final design plans, to uh, an experimental plan. And so, because a lot of things could not be for experimentation on site, you cannot uh, change a lot of things, you cannot uh, demolish anything, you cannot break the dividers and things like that. So, the plan had to be modified to take the existing structures into account. And uh, what you see in this, this image. With all the purple and the blue dots are the different types of barricades that, that could be put in place. Uh, the number of barricades that are required for that experimentation, all of that was uh, planned. And then the trial run was undertaken on site with the help of uh, 
uh, ULB officials with the help of traffic police uh, and also elected representatives. Uh, and uh, the fourth important stakeholder, which was uh, party to all the discussion, was also the shop uh, shop owners association. Uh, when we did the first trial run uh, at this delegate junction, uh, we had some learnings. The design was modified. Uh, in agreement with all the stakeholders and a lot of suggestions from different stakeholders uh, went into this, this modification. Uh, those modified designs were discussed again on site and then they were put in place. Uh, the modified design was then experimented. Uh, this is the image of the modified experiment that was undertaken on site. Uh, after that modified experiment worked out well and uh, the, and we got a good response from not just from the stakeholders or not, but also from the carriageway users. We interviewed a lot of users. Uh, there was report, there were reports in the press. Uh, once all of that was done, then uh, total station survey of those junctions was undertaken, and the plans were finalized on the total station survey, and not just the rasterized image. And presentable drawings were also developed so that. Uh, uh, stakeholders can show it to a uh, public in general, it could be shown to the media and you can get a better acceptability of the designs. Similar exercise was done, like this is an uh, intersection which is called Suraj Pool. Similar exercise was done there. Uh, up, and we did uh, another exercise, uh, another similar exercise on a deli on a junction called Delegate. delegate. After, uh, so the, beyond these three junctions, we had also worked in Udaipur on some streets. Um, there was a pedestrianization proposal that we worked on in the old city area. Uh, this, this work was started by documenting the carriageway bits in the old city area. Uh, there, was, there were some experiments done to pedestrianize that part of the city, uh, but it was faced with resistance because the uh, residents inside the old city area and also a lot of hotels inside the old city area uh, desired that vehicles should be allowed. Uh, they should not be at least. Uh, so, so we decided that we should allow, we can allow vehicles on some limited streets and we can also differentiate between four wheelers and two wheelers. So there are a lot of two wheelers, there are a lot of homeowners which are using two wheelers and two wheelers could be allowed on most of the streets but four wheelers could be restricted on some of the streets and to begin how, how that could be achieved uh, we did a documentation of the streets we prepared some proposals uh, uh, some visual uh, some visualizations of this how the streets would look when they are pedestrianized and things like that and then that was presented or an important aspect for this was that um, uh, the municipal corporation helped us identify uh, and provide land for parking, uh, land which, which could be used as off-street parking within the old city area and we documented the demand as well as the capacity for all of those places and, and uh, which three should be then motorized to provide access to those parking areas. So that exercise was done with uh, the municipal corporation. Um, and towards the end of our engagement, we had also worked out on two uh, streets, street designs. One was, I think, about one and a half to two kilometers in length, which is the Hiran Magri Road, which had enough right of way to provide. Uh, and there was, there were at this by by this stage, there was very little debate on uh, whether we'll be taking away space uh, from uh, motor vehicles if we provide for non-motorized transport. I mean, I think we we had earned some. Uh, trust uh, from the stakeholders and uh, th this proposal was very well accepted. We had uh, parking proposed, uh, some on-street parking proposed, but we most importantly, uh, we had dedicated infrastructure on the street for pedestrians and for non-motorized vehicles and both of these streets, Hidden Nagri and uh, Sima Hotel Road. Coming to Ludhiana, uh, Ludhiana was a very different um, uh, context because uh, we were, we were uh, given some intersections, uh, some five intersections to work on uh, by the municipal corporation. Uh, they were looking at some solutions uh, for these intersections and initially these intersections were not part of the smart city uh, proposal. Uh, uh, also these two of these intersections were uh, in the core area which is the old part of Ludhiana uh, near, uh, near the railway station. Uh, one of them was this uh, junction which I'm showing here, which is called the Matarani Chok. 
and uh, this junction uh, had a way as you can see in the drawing below uh, this junction has a very, very tight right of way and so a roundabout was definitely not a feasible solution but currently this junction was unsignalized or during peak hours there were policemen manning this intersection so there was a desire to uh, to basically improve traffic management of this intersection and um, so we of course as uh, we had done in udaipur we did a lot of uh, initial documentation of uh, the activities that was happening the traffic demand at this uh, at this intersection and using that uh, we developed uh, plans and we also developed uh, a, uh, not just the plans for the carriageway uh, the physical plans for the carriageway but the signalization plan these were discussed uh, with all the stakeholders and an important stakeholder here was the traffic police because the traffic signal definitely had to be managed by the traffic police and the so traffic police was involved right from the first meeting uh, and then we had a discussion in the offices we had the discussion at site then we did a lot of marking of uh, as you can see in the image below uh, whatever proposals were developed the plans that were developed they were marked on the site and uh, one yeah, there were two parts to this proposal one part was the junction itself which was to be signalized the other part was the approach roads because approach roads uh, for example had a lot of non motorized traffic <coughs> and it also had lot of uh, uh, static activity like there were hawkers and there was a temple and so there was lot of act pedestrian activity around the temple there were shops around uh, there was parking happening for shops especially there were a lot of two wheelers being parked uh, for the shops uh, so there it, there was a lot of friction in these approach roads and so uh, when we looked at the traffic numbers uh, the current carriageway was uh, two lanes divided or four lanes divided so two lanes in each direction uh, the total carriageway, carriageway width was 8 meters uh, and if you look at this image uh, below i do not know if you can see the cursor here uh, so there is a up to this white line was 7 meters two lanes uh, what we proposed was that we reduce the carriageway width for motorized traffic to 5 meters and we did this experiment by uh, putting these uh, barricades police barricades and we said that we will run the traffic on 5 meter wide carriageway and leave the rest of the 3 meters for all other functions non motorized traffic pedestrians and some two wheelers and cycle parking that is happening in that area and so we did that experiment and it worked out very well there was much lower friction the traffic moved smoothly uh, that part of the approach roads worked uh, worked out well and then we also looked at uh, the traffic uh, signal design and the way, uh, way we worked out this traffic signal design was also interesting we uh, used it, took the help of the traffic constables on the uh, at the junction uh, there were five main traffic constable five main players which were acting as the signal as the signal posts at the junction there was one in the middle at the column that is there is a flyover going uh, there is a elevated road over this junction so uh, this column of the so one constable was stationed here and then there were four, four lady constables at each of these uh, at the stop lines of each of these four approach routes uh, we uh, we brought in our signal plan one person one of us stood at the jun at the junction with the cons master constable who was in standing in the middle of the road we told him wh which side traffic to start and then when to stop it using our stop watches and then he instructed these people uh, the other constables on the side of the road and the traffic moved and that experiment he did it we, we did it did it over four cycles and that helped us refine the traffic signal which will work with the given traffic numbers at this junction and we tried to keep the traffic uh, traffic signal cycle time as low as possible and we kept it between 120 and 150 seconds uh, similar exercise uh, junction design exercise was done at another intersection in ludhiana which is the samrala chowk uh, this junction is on the highway uh, problem with this junction we started this junction as a local problem but we soon realized that the problem was at the network level because there was a lot of trucks uh from the transport nagar which were uh, approaching the highway going through this junction and so we'll then uh, the proposals that were developed they evolved from the junction design so junction designs were done and then we also developed uh with the city officials we developed this network level proposal where uh, the truck traffic would be diverted and taken directly from transport nagar to the highway uh 
in Vishakhapatnam, again, uh, we, we uh, worked on two intersections in detail. One was uh, one of them was this Diamond Park Junction. Uh, I won't take a lot of time. We basically went through the same steps. We uh, rasterized Google Earth image first. We took traffic numbers, we did activity survey, we prepared initial proposal, we had a discussion. Uh, and then the final proposal was uh, developed. In this case, we did not uh, end up doing an experiment on ground. The roundabout was already there. So uh, it was the proposal were accepted as if there was no I mean there was no desire from the city to basically try and experiment it as uh, experiment the proposals on site uh, then the other junction was Gajuwaka junction uh, it had different issues there were bus parking happening at this junction and so those things were uh, demand was captured and those issues were resolved uh, in Gwalior we worked on one junction uh, and this was called uh, the Roxy Pool junction and uh, at the Roxy Pool Junction, um, the proposal from uh, the PMC uh, in Gwalior was to demolish the junction and to develop uh, an, an addition, um, a new flyover. Uh, basically, there's an elevated road and roads from two sides are going up and meeting this elevated road. So the desire was to widen these roads which are going, the ramps which are going from the ground level and meeting the elevated road, which was uh, primarily this road here. Uh, and uh, what what uh, we proposed to them was that uh, we looked at the demand numbers, we measured the traffic, and it turned out that the demand wasn't that high. So what was proposed is that the pedestrian plaza, the ground level can be retained as an NMB, uh, can be developed as an NMB in specific infrastructure, a pedestrian plaza and a lot of other activities. And uh, with some geometric improvement, uh, the junction can be resolved as it is. Uh, also in Udaipur, uh, this was uh, the kind of, we also provided support on a project pre-feasibility. On one of the junctions in Udaipur, which is called Kumaruka Bhatta, there was a proposal for developing a flyover. This proposal wasn't going, uh, had not been able to get funding from the state level because the comments that the city had received was that uh, the city has not shown enough demand uh, for the flyover to be justified. Uh, and so, uh, we were approached to look at if, uh, the demand numbers as, so that those could be then sent back to the PWD and then uh, funding could be released for this flyover. Uh, we did this exercise. I will not get into the details of how we uh, went into estimating the numbers. Uh, we used reference class cities for estimating the numbers, but we developed uh, three uh, scenarios. Uh, two of them were business as usual scenarios. And one of them was a smart city scenario. Uh, we could show in all these three scenarios, even in a business as usual scenario, uh, the demand does not cross the required de benchmark demand for a flyover uh, up till 2032 uh, in the worst case scenario. But in a smart city scenario, when you expect a lot of other uh, improvements to be done in the city in terms of mobility, non motorized transport will improve, public transport will improve. Uh, uh, there was no uh, demand for a flyover in the in the foreseeable future, not at, until at least 2050. Uh, so that was accepted, and uh, so this this flyover was eventually shelved. Uh, uh, after we uh, the planning support, the projects that we had provided planning support was taken over by PMC. They were taken to tender stage. And in some cases, we extended the planning support uh, to an implementation support where we basically also provided, because especially for non-motorized transport, uh, the devil is in the detail. We have to provide uh, the, the detail, detailing of all the NMT infrastructure has to be good in, to ensure their use. And so we did provide a lot of details, construction details and other details uh, to the PMC to be integrated into the intended document. We had extended capacity building support, as I mentioned right in the beginning, uh, to all these four cities. And uh, this capacity building support was very different from the general capacity building support that we uh, see. I mean, it wasn't in terms of workshops or uh, seminars that we conducted in the cities. Uh, what we did was we uh, embedded four planners uh, in all of these four cities. Uh, throughout this uh, project period and these planners were embedded with the municipal corporation they became the planning arm for the corporation uh, this was done because 
the limitation the capacity limitation uh, for the corporation was at the planning level the corporation is very uh, is apt at doing implementation they are well experienced they have enough staff to do implementation of the project but it's the planning which has to uh, which has to come before the implementation uh, which uh, which seems to be missing uh, in terms of capacity and so that that capacity was embedded and uh, in some cases that capacity was completely absorbed uh, at least one of our uh, independent associates uh, in these cities um, in Nupur, was absorbed by the corporation and is now a full-time planner working with the corporation uh, we, we saw a lot of benefits by doing this. A lot of uh, planning uh, processes have been brought in, have been accepted by the corporation. Uh, most important of them being that uh, data collection has become a part of uh, doing the project development. And at least uh, all of the corporation that we have worked closely, they have started uh, collecting total station surveys, uh, developing total station surveys, and on them the projects are being developed. Uh, then of course there were some workshops also that were undertaken at the national level. Uh, this, uh, the, the broad learnings and impressions that we had with our, uh, from our engagements in these uh, four cities uh, are these. First of all, that to provide the N, to, uh, to develop NMT infrastructure uh, in in our cities uh, actually. Uh, so capacity or the space requirement is really not a barrier. Uh, that space is available if you see in terms of the number of the amount of traffic that these at least these major routes are carrying. And uh, so all 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 the cities that we were working in had enough space to accommodate uh, non-motorized transport infrastructure, specific non-motorized transport infrastructure, and that was demonstrated through one the on-ground experiments. Uh, all that was required was a planning centric approach, uh, which should uh, the, the project should start with a planning centric approach before uh, implementation of the project starts. Uh, so the prioritization has to change from the implementation centric approach to planning centric approach. And the third important learning was that frugal solutions uh, work very well. Uh, you can do very simple uh, things, simple changes, low cost changes uh, to geometry. Uh, if you if you really make these uh, planned changes to the geometry, a lot of improvement can be achieved, uh, not just for non-motorized traffic, also for motorized traffic. I think that is all. Thank you. I will hand it over to Ashish. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep, for Hello. Um, so thank you, Ashish and Sandeep, for this webinar and sharing your knowledge with us. 
so one of the key aspects in ensuring uh, low carbon mobility in cities is to cater to the non motorized transit modes. So currently, the Census of India 2000 says that 11% of people are either walking or cycling to work. However, uh, uh, this mode of transport, that is walking, is something that we all use. That is, either if you are a public transport user, a two-wheeler user, or a private vehicle owner, we all eventually at some point end up walking in the cities. Hence, improving the NMT structure uh, is becomes very important. And by improving the NMT infrastructure, we're not only solving the mobility problems of our cities, but as a byproduct, we're also making public spaces, which makes our cities more dynamic, radiant, and livable. A combination of these two, that is a good street design, combined with a good NMT infrastructure, it actually, in the Western country, this has been observed, encourages people to shift from private vehicles to walking or bicycling. Uh, I would like to thank the team of ITLA South Asia and Sandeep Gandhi Architects uh, for working with us, for the support with us on this project in uh, demonstrating and showing an implementation support to the smart cities and uh, actually showing how improving the infrastructure can make the cities a better place. Uh, this actually also resonates with our belief at Shakti, where at one level we're working on uh, support for policy making. But we also realized that uh, there is also a need for demonstration, proof of concept, as Sandeep had mentioned. And we also need to build the capacity of the cities so that all of this work can be scaled up. And this can be then worked at all the cities across India. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ashish. I think a wonderful presentation from from Sandeep. Uh, fantastic work. And I think this is what we need more in our cities uh, in terms of how do you prioritize walking, cycling, and public transport in, in our cities and more to do with walking because uh, even if you are using public transport, you still need to accept that public transport and therefore walking is important. And so some data which has come even from the census, if you look at huge number of people who walk to work. And I mean, even if you look at, I mean, while these three examples was from kind of small and medium time cities, if you look at bigger cities like Delhi in Mumbai, Mumbai has more people walking to work than all the other modes combined. So the question is, if we have so much amount of population which is walking, why are we creating cities which are not conducive to walking? So as you rightly said, creating streets for all. I think that all starts with the walking. Because unless you have people to walk, you are really kind of not building streets. Then you are building highways inside the city. And highways are meant for motor vehicles. So if you look at the national urban transport policies, which is the underlying theme is focus on moving people and not vehicle, we have to start making kind of things from the working perspective. So that's one. The other point which I also wanted to make, and this is a, a big disconnect in cities, is that you cannot build your cities out of congestion. So no matter how much road, how much flyover, how much underpasses you build, you will not be able to solve congestion. So I think this myth has to go away. And so this whole kind of idea of building cities out of congestion has not worked in any city of the world and therefore it will not work in any Indian city as well. We have to make sure that we kind of incentivize people on walking, cycling and using public transport. So these three case examples are great and I think we have to look at how do we scale it up and that will really require a systemic change even in the capacities of these urban local bodies. So the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm taking this case is that if you look at the city engineers or people who are managing mobility in cities are, easily, are mostly civil engineers or they are trained as highway engineers. So they, do, they by 
by kind of education, they don't have expertise to differentiate between an urban road and urban street and a highway. And so these examples do show that managing design well can give you huge benefits. And if we can, in a way, kind of systematize this in a way that it the capacity and the structures get built in into the urban local bodies, the municipal corporate authorities, we will see a much more systemic change. But nevertheless, great start, great case studies. I think we are following the right track. And these examples will inspire the cities as well as other cities to take this matter on an urgent basis. So thank you once again for inviting me to listen to this wonderful presentation. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Well, thank you for your comment. You see, starting to realize the need for getting details and our design for. Uh, one thing that I wanted to ask uh, you at this point is it sounds very good when we talk about it. But then we have a number of our cities in India where we have city policies, guidelines, which can have an implementation on the ground under a larger uh, common thinking. However, we see that a lot has not changed on the ground. Do you have any thoughts? So great question, Ashish. And I think what we need, I personally feel there are so many couple of things to happen. One, we need more such examples because there's still perception that even if you give an inch of space to a pedestrian, you are increasing congestion. So I live in a city which is next to Delhi called Gurugam. We have a so-called urban road, a sector, a sector road, which has 16 lanes for motor vehicles. That road does not even have 16 inches for footpath. And if you ask the planners to allocate 16 inch, the response is it will cause congestion. Now, 
if 16 lanes of road are not solving congestion, how will additional 16 inches of road going to solve congestion? So I think we need more such examples, and that's where organizations like ICLEI and others come in to give this proof of concept that it works, because still engineers and city administrators think that it won't work. So that's point number one. Second, if we can do some before and after analysis to show even in hard numbers that yes, it improves not only about perception. So before after numbers, that will be point number two. And point number three, somehow if we can engage a larger audience around. It. So a lot of this conversation usually happens with technical people like us, but how we can engage, let's say business, how we can engage community, how we can engage a larger ecosystem. Because once we have that bind, I think the change will accelerate fast. Thank you, Ashish. So, so I, I completely agree I, with what you say is that there is definitely a need to scale up and there is a need for more examples of such things. Uh, not only in four cities now, but maybe in all the uh, 4,000 census towns that we have across India. But I will also go back to the point that Amit mentioned earlier that we also need right people in the city uh, administration. So for now, uh, do we have planners in the city who can understand these issues, who understand these issues when we are working on it? So we also need to have the right capacity within the city authorities. And I think thirdly, uh, while we're implementing it, uh, we should maybe look at a step-by-step -step implementation instead of a complete overall in one day. So for example, when Copenhagen decided to be a bicycle friendly city, it was over a period of 30 years and they took away uh, space from cars in a phased out manner. So if we take one car space at a time, you know, it doesn't, the, the, the car, private vehicle use don't feel the pinch. So we had to go at a, it at a very step by step process and uh, hopefully that will uh, lead us to the results that we want to see. Great, thank you. More examples on ground, that sounds like a recipe that we should be uh, following. Thank you for your comments. I think I would want to now take up the questions that have been raised by the participants, and some of them are addressed directly to the presenter. So the first question is about uh, uh, in Ludhiana, the cycle length of 150 seconds, seconds was used. Is there a reason for that? Something okay. Like okay. Uh, uh, in, so, a smaller cycle length is desirable for any intersection because it reduces the delays for pedestrians and non motorized vehicles uh, in crossing. So the longer the cycle is, the longer is the wait time for pedestrians to cross. So uh, and also it's more efficient because uh, it's the first 30 to 40 seconds of green which uh, allows the maximum throughput or the maximum rate of throughput of vehicles. So we basically use that concept and we worked around that. Uh, uh, we started with a 120 second signal cycle. And uh, I think uh, we ended up with two plans. Uh, in the evening, this, uh, so in the morning peak, the signal cycle extended to 150 seconds, and in the evening it was at 120 seconds. I think I hope I have answered the question. Thanks, Anil. I think there's another question that I want to follow it up with. It's focused on motorists. The question is, um, how can we work on building capacity of motorists? So looking at uh, bus trucks and car drivers, how do we train them so they respect the NLP users? I can't be unmuted. Maybe I'm with them. Uh, 
very difficult to plan and uh, dedicated bicycle infrastructure which physically uh, prevents motorbikes from because uh, the physical characteristics of a non motorized vehicle is not the motorized vehicle so a cycle rickshaw is much wider than a motorcycle and so if you are designing an in a non motorized lane which allows cycle rickshaw and cycles uh and you want it to be not obstructive it doesn't it should not slow down the cyclist then you, then you, there is no no physical means no physical workable designs and lot of designs were experimented with in delhi in pune uh, that, uh, that that can physically block out two wheelers it requires enforcement and probably at some level it also requires some acceptability so if a two wheeler is using uh, a, a, a Lane which is designated for non motorized transport at a speed that will non motorized transport move, it is actually fine. For example, in Netherlands, two wheelers uh, can use non motorized lanes as long as they are moving at a slow speed. Uh, so, uh, what I what I realized is that in our designs in the cities, uh, typically near the intersection. will enter the non motorized lanes but they are much slower than they would be uh, in the big block sections and in the big block sections the entry non motorized lanes is not attractive for two wheelers and so they remain outside it uh, also work that was done in delhi prt it shows that uh, it's either enforcement or it's a sort of bigger this sort of building in the acceptability of causing two wheelers some lot only some parts of the non motorized lane that uh, that works Well, I think it's a it's a fair question and, and really a, a kind of strong observation. Uh, we need to have expertise built in uh, in the urban local bodies. But what is really important is to build the right expertise, and therefore, people who are trained in kind of dealing with these issues, whether they are hired short term or long term, is a good start. But eventually, this capacity has to be. part of the urban local board is only then change will happen uh, we have seen some models where people are second in force organization for some time it works as long as these people are there when they move out then again it falls flat so we have to look at structural reform of the urban local bodies but building in kind of subject matter expertise 
who have done, who have been trained in this field would really help a lot in advancing some of the conversation in the cities.